So welcome, Jorge Perez. Um, I had run across an article you had done, maybe, I think the article date was 2016, and it was yeah. about your work applying Six Sigma to the YMCA. So I wanted to have you on as a guest to learn a little bit more about that experience and uh, how you've applied process improvement to uh, a nonprofit sector. But uh, maybe just if you could share a little bit of your background and some of the work you've done, and then maybe lead into some of that work. Yeah, well, um, I've been with the YMCA for 27 years, but before that, I spent about 10 years uh, working in education and uh, spending time with kids, trying to get them into college. These are first generation college students, uh, kids who are not likely to go to school. In fact, I tracked a group of sixth graders who were selected because they only had a 15% graduation rate from Woodrow Wilson High School uh, four years later. And so, um, you know, I tell people I've, I spent the first part of my career preventing things, drug prevention, gang prevention, dropout prevention, pregnancy prevention, and eventually began to see a pattern with all of those services. I began to see that uh, this, this way you prevent, let's say a, a, a girl from getting pregnant or from a guy getting a girl pregnant is by making sure that they have a bright future, that they have adult caring adult relationship uh, and that um, they have uh, some level of support system around them. And it's the same way you prevent kids from joining gangs and from um, connecting to uh, other uh, self-destructive behaviors. And that's how I ended up at the YMCA. So for 27 years, I worked for YMCAs across uh, uh, across the mid-America, mid primarily uh, starting in uh, Dallas, then went over to Indianapolis for a few years, uh, came over to Cincinnati. Uh, so 15 years ago was the first time I'd been in Cincinnati. I'm there now. Went over to St. Louis, and then uh, oversaw our uh, national work with young people uh, in our national office in Chicago, which is where I uh, did a lot of the Six Sigma work uh, that you mentioned, and then came back to Cincinnati for the last five years, still practicing Six Sigma. In fact, the previous uh, phone call or Zoom I was on, we were talking about uh, the uh, a Six Sigma process as we make some decisions about data analytics. That's great. So where, how did you get that background? Um, was that part of school or did you learn that and uh, from another company or? I'd like yeah, to that's a great, that. that's a great question. You know, uh, one of the things I discovered um, as I was moving through the ranks is we had this really clearly defined things we did to help people. Um, but when it came to business and process improvement and trying to uh, make efficient certain programs, um, I mean, it was like crickets. Uh, and I remember taking a, a class. I have a degree, an MBA from the University of Dallas um, and taking a class on process improvement. And I remember learning about Six Sigma. Uh, and so I decided I was just going to go full bore and went to our local university here and picked up a green belt uh, at uh, Xavier University and began to practice Six Sigma. Um, I also uh, spoke to uh, volunteers from General Electric uh, and several other corporations around here that use uh, Six Sigma or Lean. And it became pretty obvious that we needed to get better at that. And so what it did is allowed us to be more intentional about how we made decisions for improvements because uh, when you don't have a system then you're left with guessing uh, at best um, and many many nonprofits uh, and i'm over generalizing but i've now been enough in enough of them to know that many nonprofits that's how they make decisions they make decisions based on their own experiences. They throw stuff on the wall to see if it sticks, and then they just keep doing it. Really never real understanding why it worked or why it didn't work, um, which explains, by the way, why uh, a lot of nonprofits struggle to replicate or scale. 
because they know that it works where they are, but they don't really know why it works. And therefore, it is hard to teach it. And I've seen plenty of examples where nonprofits are teaching others how they made something work in their part of the world, only to watch it fail everywhere else because they really didn't understand why it worked. Yeah, that's pretty, um, pretty typical. I think it's, it's, there's a lot going on and they're trying things as best they can. Um, but yeah, it's hard to take that extra time to collect the data or to evaluate that data and make sure that was the reason or this is the main driver of that. So you have that knowledge versus, well, it's working now or it didn't work and we're, we've got three other things that we're working on at the same time. So I don't have that time or, the, or feel I have the time to go really study and understand whether why it worked well or why it didn't work well. It's kind of on to the next thing already. I think human beings, we are so good at uh, discerning or looking at things and making on the fly decisions. Uh, that's why we have these big brains. But sometimes they work against us and they work against us because we believe that we can use what we've used all of our lives to quickly assess the situation and apply it to everyday work. And you know what? A lot of times it works. There's a reason why people wing it because winging works. The problem again is understanding how to replicate, how to scale, how to uh, uh, recreate the conditions that made something work. And I'll give you an example of that. Um, and it's a little bit of a comical example. I remember going to a, a conference and these camp leaders were talking about why kids were having better fun at their camp, more fun. And um, the leader just talked about how they decided to improve the, the camper experience. And these were overnight camps. And they did things like um, uh, made sure that there was smell of pine in every cabin. So they bought these little, um, uh, these little uh, scented candles and things that uh, they, they placed all over. They even actually hung these little scents um, devices up on trees along the trail and stuff like that. And then they talked about cleanliness and songs and people were taking notes and just loving what this guy was saying. At the end, he says, uh, let me give you information about where you can buy these scented candles, these scented devices. Um, and people were again buying them. And I remember leaving, they have no clue why, what they did worked. What they did was did a lot of things, but they really don't know why it worked. And sure enough, uh, I went back to take a look at what happened uh, to those camps uh, that decided to follow the pattern. And, you know, there was no discernible benefit. There was no discernible improvements. Uh, I believe that somewhere in all the things they were doing, they did one or two things that really worked, but they don't know which one it was. And so that's what we do again in nonprofits. Oftentimes uh, we're social workers, we're educators, um, and we uh, uh, just try to use what we learned in those uh, areas of practice on how to manage an organization. And it does work sometimes, but oftentimes we don't really know why something worked. Yeah, I think um, in that example, did they have some data that showed that the campers were happy or they were just- Well, they did. I mean, they, okay. they, they, they what they did is they measured uh, whether this, the camper satisfaction had improved and whether they were going to, um, recommend that camp uh, to other uh, campers, kids. So okay. a net promoter score. Yes. So yeah, yeah, they did see an improvement, but they don't know what caused it. What factors, yes. Yeah. Got it. And that those are dangerous conditions right there. When you don't know why what you did work uh, is dangerous because you'll keep doing what you perceive to be what worked and it may not be what worked. And 
um, another example of that, and we actually did that in that uh, report that you mentioned earlier, we wanted to improve uh, after school programs for kids. So we launched into a Six Sigma process and we had six, nine potential things to focus in on. And these were not necessarily practices. These were just things that we were looking at. We called them nine dimensions of well-being. And we believe nine things were too many. So we wanted to see what the data told us about what, what, was, what, would, be, what would be the biggest drivers of impact. And so we measured tens of thousands of kids in camps all over the country and out popped out a, three words, achievement, relationship, and belonging. We need, we discovered that kids needed to achieve or learn something. They needed to do it in relationships with other people, other kids, other counselors, and they needed to be, be given an opportunity to contribute to that experience, to bring their own gifts, to bring their own talents and be celebrated for it. And if you could do that, then those kids would have a great after school, a great summer camp experience, a great youth sports experience, and it no longer mattered what it was. So if you did pickleball, if you did trails, if you did high adventure, if you did after school child care, doesn't matter, make sure the kids have achievement relationship of belonging and we gave examples of how that worked and we could scale it we trained it we scaled it and we begin to see uh, improvements in just about every program uh, because we weren't focused on the ingredients we were focused on the conditions uh, and they were they were tested and retested uh, just on a side note we asked the same question for the adults and guess what we came up with the same three things Data told us human beings never stop wanting uh, to achieve, relate, and belong. And right now at the YMCA, that's what we're measuring. Well, like the uh, candle example, too. It's like if you have 10 things you did and then you have to do all 10 things because you don't know which actually worked. Same thing with this is you can keep it simplified to here's the recipe and you put your own ingredients in whether you if you don't like pickleball no problem you just insert whatever activity you like it just follow the recipe of that and it gives it flexibility and um it's still effective but it's not so locked in because we don't know what's actually what actually matters so i think that's makes it easier and, and less costly in a lot of cases too yeah oftentimes you end up understanding that um, it's not about the quality of things. I mean, we did this, when we did this, I visited two camps and you, they couldn't be more different. One camp catered to upper middle class uh, kids. Um, we're talking um, children of senators, representatives, lawyers, doctors. Uh, the cost was upwards of $2,000, uh, $3,000 for four weeks of camp. And on the other extreme was this very primitive camp. It was low cost. Uh, they couldn't afford much of the other things. I mean, the other one had lodges and beautiful and it was climate control and they had selling and, and it was gorgeous. You would go there and say, gosh, this is one of the best camps I've ever been to. The other one looked like somebody's backyard, you know, just there's some trees and there's a place where you could put a camp uh, or a tent and there's where we build a fire and we eat over under this tree and stuff like that. Pretty primitive. Both of them applied achievement, relationship, and belonging. And both of them saw improvements in their uh, experience, camper experience, because it wasn't about the amenities. It was about the experience. Um, now, no doubt that the nicer camp has some, some advantages. Um, there's something to be said about a beautiful uh, venue, but we've all been to places that were gorgeous and beautiful, and it was the worst experiences we've ever had, whether they be hotels or rental cars or um, uh, travel experience, because it's not about just that, it's about the other things. Um, and I think it allowed our colleagues, like a lot of my colleagues, to focus on the things that mattered and spend time and energy there rather than spending it on lodges and um, 
beautiful experiences. If you can get those, great, but make sure the kids are achieving latent belonging and uh, then the magic happens. Yeah, that's great. Um, any, because I, I think the, the concepts around lean resonate with people a little bit better because, you know, the, the principles around like visualizing the work and simplifying and engaging people in the process and uh, looking at flow and time and stuff like that, I think is really straightforward. But I, I do struggle with explaining Six Sigma to people and then especially in nonprofits. So yeah, is there any other examples with like the data part of this that you found helpful or you've run across where um, other nonprofits could benefit if they looked at their, I don't know if there's like charting that you do on metrics or any other examples that we could help um, show the benefit of well, you some know, of those guys? Uh, yeah, well, so one of the things that I learned early on, and I think I discovered this when I was going through my uh, Sigma training, and then I've had plenty of conversations uh, uh, where we've had black belts work with us and or on staff. Um, and one of the things I've learned is that the, the Maic uh, or Six Sigma has a lot of flexibility to it. In fact, that's where Lean and all of these other items pop out is that somebody said, well, what if we don't apply the whole gamut of, of um, uh, the Maic uh, of the Six Sigma and just apply segments of it? But you're still looking at data, you're still analyzing, you're still testing uh, before you get to control, before you get to this place where you're saying this is the way we're going to do them. Um, one of the, one of the, so that's the first thing I tell people is that don't feel like you've got to do the whole thing. Uh, I love to use examples like uh, Excel or Outlook or Word. If you ever go and look at the very top of those programs, you soon discover that most of us use about 5% of all of its capabilities. Microsoft Word is a very powerful word processing system that does all sorts of amazing things. Most of us just use a very simple uh, uh, segments like uh, spell check and a few other things. But for the most part, we just write and text and so, or write emails and stuff like that or letters. Uh, Excel is the same way. It can do some really powerful calculations, but you don't need to do that. You can just use uh, just a few things. Well, uh, I believe Six Sigma is just like that. If you want to do advanced Six Sigma, great. In fact, when I tell people about Six Sigma, I say, go watch some videos, but don't watch the long video. Watch the five minute explanation of Six Sigma, because if you watch the two hour explanation of Six Sigma, you'll run away screaming because uh, it's a scary thing, for, especially for those of us that um, pick the social sciences for a reason. Uh, we are not mathematicians. Right. Um, and so once you've done that, then go in and, and say, OK, what is the process like? And I uh, we actually do this training. We develop a, series of videos. They're all about five or 10 minutes long under each of this, uh, the Demaic principles. But we, we do these things. We just don't take time to do them well. So we define problems, right? Something's not working. And so we say something's not working. The transportation or the field trip we're on, we, lock, we keep losing kids. Okay, there's a problem. There's a defect. Um, and then we do go into measurements. I just told you we lost two kids and uh, we do this many field trips. Um, the problem is we jump right into solutions typically right there and then. Uh, and then announce this is the new solution. And it may work. It may be, it actually might work. Um, buddy, you uh, in, initiate a buddy system and now kids don't get lost because they're in, they're in a buddy system. Um, or it may not work at all. And you add another layer to the buddy system. So now you got wristbands and colored t-shirts and, and uh, you know, only uh, uh, 
you know, you count the kids five times and you just keep adding layers so that you don't lose the kids. And eventually you'll figure it out, but now you've got layers upon layers of things that who knows which one of those worked. Right. Um, what the Demaic process or lean does is it tells you to slow down a little bit, to keep collecting data. I tell folks the measurement part of the Six Sigma process will take you the longest. So if you're in a month long Six Sigma process, you might spend two weeks just collecting data, maybe more. Um, because you want to keep asking, what else should we be measuring? What else should we be measuring? Uh, and then you go into the an analyze phase, which is your shortest phase, because I think you can overthink that. Um, and again, you don't have to use all the tools of Six Sigma. You can just use a handful of them. I find, Brian, that once I get people to collect enough information, they just get better at the other three things that remain. Their analysis are better. Uh, their tests or improve is really strong. And then they now know what to control for what worked and what didn't work. Um, and so don't overthink Six Sigma. It's uh, actually uh, not that difficult. I, the way I def use uh, Six Sigma, the way I describe it to people is Six Sigma is to is to books what a book or what a bookshelf is to books uh, and uh, it does that for decision making it just organizes the decision making process that's it uh, so you can decide to put all your books on the floor and try to organize them on the floor or you can put them on a bookshelf al alphabetize them and organize them and that's what Six Sigma does. It just organizes the decision-making process and it keeps your decisions organized, tracked. Uh, and if I could just add, it allows you to move much faster. It feels like you're slow, but it's, I, I, if I want to go fast, I use the DMAIC process. Yeah, I think that's, that's a great way to put it. I really like that. I think, um, not overwhelming people with some of the more technical stuff because you're right it does scare a lot of people off like oh i have to be a statistician to to do this and that's not what we really run across that often it's it's more that there's some simple data to collect and it doesn't take deep analysis to figure out what that's data is telling us um, and i think that the the idea of overcomplicating the process happens a lot and we end up having a lot of waste because we try three or four different things and then one of those works and we're not sure which one. So you got to keep all those wasteful ones in there too, because that might've been it too. Um, and, uh, but I also think the, the idea of to go fast, that's the fast is really the getting results. And I think people want to go fast into implementation. That's right. And that's not necessarily getting results because if you're implementing the wrong thing, you're gonna loop through that way longer. And so that time spent up front getting good data and understanding the problem better will save you time getting to the actual benefits. And I think that's the time that people overlook. They wanna get into that solution mode. They wanna be doing something and telling people we're on it, we're, we've got these actions, we're implementing something but are those the right things and will it actually lead to results? And that's the speed we wanna to get to, um, which takes a little longer upfront, but it saves time in the long run, like you said. Oh, it's just, it's, you know, I, it not just saves time, it saves uh, money, uh, it, it improves impact. Uh, and if I, before I forget to say this, even if you don't wanna ever, use Six Sigma for yourself. If you don't want to do the green belt, the yellow belt, whatever, the brown belt, black belt, uh, and you're looking for board members to serve on your uh, nonprofit, go and identify a black belt somewhere out there and ask them to do a project uh, as part of their service. Um, I had a friend that uh, he called me and he wanted to know a little bit about this. He actually ran the uh, Big Brothers Big Sisters program and uh, we were talking about uh, the Demaic process. And he said, I don't know if I could ever do that. So why don't you get a volunteer to help you with that? I think you guys have 
uh, some folks from um, the, the the Deer Tractor uh, Corporation, and they use Six Sigma in their manufacturing. So why don't you do that? And so they they uh, he went out and found one. And here's the question they pose: Is what makes a successful pairing in Big Brothers Big Sisters? And they defined a successful pairing as a pair that lasts more than two years. So, because they had a real problem with turnover, um, they weren't sticking. And so this black belt said, okay, well, let me get to it and begin to gather data and ask a lot of questions and uh, had several meetings. And over the summer, this individual collected another data that he then presented to the group. And he discovered things no one had thought about. Uh, specifically, he understood what made the most successful pairing, and here's what it was. He said, when you have a kid, uh, particularly a, um, uh, a, a boy who is, um, you pair with a, 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 an adult male, and you make sure that that adult male um, is having a is has a relationship or establish a connection with the parent, not with the child, but with the parent, particularly if it's a female parent, then their likelihood of success is really, really high because that parent is looking for a surrogate dad mm. for that boy. If, however, the pairing is between a girl for a girl and the parent is a female. Uh, so you're, you're uh, I, um, identifying a volunteer who's a woman, a, a big sister. That's the least successful pairing because they're afraid you're a replacement. And so what you want to do is focus your connection with the child themselves and to say often, I'm not your parent. I could never replace your parent. And to say it often enough that the parent hears it. Mm. Uh, and that makes a successful thing. This guy who works on tractors discovered that. <laughs> wow. And they got better. Their uh, uh, success rates got so good in that uh, nonprofit. This was in Indianapolis. They became the national standard on how they recruit uh, and train volunteers out of Indianapolis because they use Six Sigma to do it. They expanded and went faster because they took their time at the beginning to understand. That's a, that's a really good example too, kind of to show the interactions that happen too with the different genders and how that relates and, and then understanding why would that be that way and then start to figure out that logic behind it. Yeah, that's, Fascinating. They can't just apply a generic statement that, oh, we just need to be in communication with the parent. That's one thing, but it also depends on, yeah, the, the parent and the volunteer and, and how that can play positively or negatively in some ways. Yeah, Brian, they had uh, 10 things that they were tracking. Uh, how often they communicated with the parents, what uh, forms that they filled out, how often did they build a good connection with the kids and they were focusing on so many things and they just couldn't improve it this guy comes in and basically says uh, only one of the items you're measuring matters and this one thing you're not measuring matters most and so they went from 10 things they were tracking to just four or five and really improved the success of those relationships with That's great. Yeah, that's a good example too. Just even understanding what is success. I mean, I think that's a challenging, huh. you know, definition. And and then once you can get that determined, I think that really starts to get momentum behind that. Once people know what the what good looks like, and that we can measure that, and it isn't all subjective or it's only it's difficult to do. Yeah, it is difficult, but there is some way we can gain some insights into what that looks like. And then I think that then naturally some of the improvement will happen just because they have a clear oh, idea yeah. of what the outcome they're trying to get to. It also will tell you when 
and help you really, once you kind of get to the, this is what works, you also add a new set of potential defects uh, to potential programs. So I'll go back to the achievement, relationship, belonging, finding. We then applied it to youth sports. So we were doing after school and summer camp, then we applied it to youth sports. And to our horror, we discovered that we were failing miserably. We were actually surprised by that because if intuitively, if there's a program that's helping kids achieve relate and belong, it's gotta be youth sports, right? You're learning how to play basketball. You're learning how to run the bases. You're learning how to kick the ball and you're doing it in a team. There's relationships and you're a member of that team. So there's belonging. Uh, what's going on there? And the scores were terrible. And what we discovered is when the com when competition gets infused into achievement, relationship and belonging, it ruins it. And so you have to you have to protect kids in a competitive environment because uh, the relationships cut deeper. The the um, the pressure to achieve is transformed to. Uh, uh, to a toxic level and belonging uh, is always in question. Am I helping or am I hurting? And we had to retrain our coaches. We had to retrain our staff and uh, we now separate competitive programs to non-competitive programs uh, because we want to make sure the kids are protected if they don't want to be non-competitive. We've also made sure that our competitive programs don't become toxic. All that happened because we did Six Sigma. Yeah, that's really great insights. So um, I really like the idea of like having someone with some experience come on and help with the nonprofit. And, and I think we've got a lot of people that listen that are interested in, in working with a nonprofit, but maybe not sure how to make that first step or connection. Um, also, I, I liked your idea of the board members maybe reaching out and asking for assistance from the community. There's usually a plenty of organizations that have internal process improvement experts that would love to give back. They just not sure how or who to connect to. So I don't know if you have any thoughts or ideas around kind of that connection of connecting the volunteers with this process improvement to to help with the nonprofit or what, what do you think would work best given your role at a nonprofit? Yeah, I mean, I, I would start by uh, just um, connecting with a nonprofit that really already connects to you. So don't overthink this. If you love puppies, then go and talk to people over at the kennel. If you love animal life, then go to the zoo if you love youth sports because you were a part of youth sports, go and find a nonprofit that does youth sports. And if you like to go hikes, take long hikes in the woods and in nat national parks and go and serve or go identify those nonprofits. So you identify the nonprofits already attached to your mission, to your passion. And then go visit with these individuals and help them understand what you do. And that's gonna be the trickiest part because uh, again, process improvement is not something we do. So you start using the language of process improvement and there you're going to overwhelm them. Uh, what you want to do is say, hey, listen, I work in an industry or I am part of a group that looks at how people do things, both in manufacturing and in um, customer service. Uh, and our job is to improve experiences and outcomes. We're not evaluators in the sense of, of, of social science. They're used to that group. Uh, we're evaluators in terms of experiences and processes. Um, we could use this, the impact evaluation um, by helping you understand what it is that you want to accomplish uh, and then just build trust with them start with a small project don't go right into the deepest part of the pool yet um, and, and and just help them improve one little thing and then after a while they're just going to start calling you 
and asking you for more. I have a friend here that uh, works for the parks department. We were talking about continuous improvement. Um, uh, and he uh, wanted to know uh, what, what trails got more use and specifically why. What trails got more use and specifically why. So to see if we can improve the other trails. The, the intuitive answer to that question by a naturalist is, well, you know, they got to be nice. You got to be able to see some nice things. The trail has to be well maintained. If we spend money on that, then that will improve walkability and trail use. And it didn't. They spent uh, tens of thousands of dollars improving some trails that were underutilized, and it didn't work. So I talked to him about using a uh, somebody to do Six Sigma. We went to the local university, got a class that was willing to do this as a project. And they just looked at people, observed people, connected with people, um, and just watched them. Uh, they actually got these deer tracking cameras. These are cameras that hunters use to track deer movement, and they, they were tracking people. Uh, it was fascinating what they did. And what they began to understand is that uh, a lot of the hikers, especially the novice hikers, which was the group that was struggling with these trails, um they uh were very very concerned about where they parked and the safety of the parking area that's what it was it was not the trails it was the parking lot wow and uh they identified that because somebody decided to put a camera one of the six sigma persons decided to put a camera in the parking lot and wanted to see what they were doing to prepare and when the parking lot was well lit, well organized, looked safe, uh, the, the parking lot time took, was short. They just got out, they get in it, and they went right to their trails. Uh, the others were a little longer, people were hiding things, putting things away. Some of them drove off. And all they did was improve lighting, clean up some bushes, and the trails got used. They didn't have to spend the $10,000. <laughs> Yeah, that's great. I, I think that's the, those are the best ones is that it takes you down a, ra uh, a pathway that you wouldn't have suspected. It wasn't intuitive. Um, and yeah, all that time and effort wasted on something that wasn't going to lead to results. I mean, they ended up with nice trails. Sure. Uh, the people that walked through them loved them like they did the others. Uh, but their interest in increasing foot traffic on the others uh, could have been solved by improving the parking lot uh, and signage uh, in the parking lot, putting things like, you know, uh, here are three things you could do to be safe. The things they had in the other parking lot, I'm not real sure what, uh, yeah. so. <laughs> um, I think the students is a great idea too. I think that's a great opportunity for students to get an experience and a project and they're, they're driven, they have the time they um, usually there's an assignment that's tied to it. So they have motivation. Um, they're moving hopefully qu quickly um, and can be, I think a, a neat set of eyes. And yeah, I, th I think that's really under leveraged in terms of students going through classes, looking for real world, real world projects, connecting them up with nonprofits to get that experience and give the, the nonprofits a really good projects so that they can learn from the students and also students get that valuable experience of kind of, yeah, practicing what they've learned in school. Well, and I think there are also going to be some students that they are driven to be uh, analysts. They, 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 it's what they want to, but for any number of reasons, they just have decided they don't want to do that for a living. And then they're, they're stuck. Mm -hmm. They don't want to do the analytics for a living. They want to make a difference with their lives. And uh, they can launch a whole desperately needed field in a lot of these spaces. Um, too often, uh, what you end up with indiv are individuals that work all day long at a job they don't like, and then work very, very hard to spend the weekends or the evenings doing the things they love and uh, they're passionate about. And my response is, why don't you do both? Why don't you find a passion you're in? Now, 
to be fair, you're not going to make a lot of money uh, being a black belt at a nonprofit. Uh, we hired a woman uh, that uh, did some work for Goodrich, uh, the tire company. And she uh, volunteered at one of our yoga classes and she overheard one of our staff members talking about Six Sigma. And she asked, what's this about Six Sigma? What are you guys doing? And she found out we were doing some things. I met with her and she said, you know, I've been, I've been wanting to make a career change. Is this something I can do? And I said, yes, but I can't afford you. You need to know that. And she said, well, what can you afford? And we negotiated a little bit and uh, she ended up taking a $100,000 a year pay cut. Um, but she, she, and this is now I'm quoting her, that these last three years have been the best years of her life. Um, it just gave her meaning that tires didn't. Um, and so for those students, for those individuals that are listening to this recording that are wanting to make a difference, uh, and have had a uh, have had some tough questions to ask over the last couple of years. I think we've all been asking some tough questions. There's a real opportunity for you to do some good work in this space uh, because the need has only gotten bigger and the resources have gotten smaller, which means we have to get better at what we do and uh, folks that do continuous improvement have the answers to the questions we're asking. Yeah, I think that's, you know, a, a theme I'm hearing just talking to a few students here and there. Um, you know, they're looking at engineering fields and they're like, I don't, I'm not motivated to go work in a factory. Mm -hmm. um, and some of it's perception that they've not spent a lot of time in one and they have ideas of what that is. And they might realize it's not as bad as they think. Um, but also I think it's really about, yeah, what am I, doing and I think the younger generations are really concerned about what's the value and the impact I'm going to have not just about a job and making money and stuff so I think this is a, a great opportunity of uh, how can we connect them up with the skill set that is needed and their desires to want to have an impact and um, I think the there's industrial engineering pathways and there's um, some systems engineering and some supply chain management. And I think they're getting some school uh, training in school around lean and Six Sigma a little bit, it seems. And some other engineering fields are getting that as well. Um, the MBA students, I think, are getting in introductions to some of these concepts too. But um, so I think those fields in general, I think the students coming out of them, uh, those areas would be great if they could look or have those uh, discussions with nonprofits and say, here's what I'm looking for. And maybe coming right out of school, yeah, they could make more somewhere else, but maybe they'll be happy just having a good steady salary and um, find some rewarding work. So yeah, I think there is some great opportunity there. Well, and the field is wide open. I mean, uh, you can either go compete where the field is already packed with others doing the same work uh, you think about data analytics right now and the fast moving world of, of big data and uh, artificial intelligence and so forth and so on. Uh, and so all the for profits are up to their eyeballs and people thinking about and working on these kinds of issues. Okay. No one or few are doing that for nonprofits. So the third sector is ripe for people that want to make not just a difference with their with their lives, but make a difference in an entire industry. Um, and so uh, boy, big brothers, big sisters, boys and girls clubs, YMCA's, churches, uh, and on and on are desperately in need of uh, people that are willing to lend their services uh, to help uh, drive the kind of change uh, that th these nonprofits drive. And again, this could be applied everywhere. That, there's a church that uh, he is here in Cincinnati that's using some of the continuous improvement work uh, from some of their uh, uh, staff and or volunteers that used to work at Procter and Gamble. Mm -hmm. And they're using, using continuous improvement to improve uh, the church experience. And it's growing like crazy 
because they're not wasting time on things that don't work. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's just a really cool way to do some pretty exciting things. And if I could just add the, the new uh, world we live in, uh, you have a podcast, uh, you're in a whole different part of the country. Uh, you, we could have this conversation uh, around the world. Yep. So don't limit yourself to even your community. If the uh, Boys and Girls Club's not ready to talk to you in your city, then talk to a Boys and Girls Club in Dallas. Talk to a Boys and Girls Club in Houston. Work your network and find someone because we're all very close and nearby each other today because of Zoom, because of technology. And so um, I uh, did some work with Six Sigma with my colleagues, my counterparts in Australia. Uh, they called me and they said, hey, can you help us understand this whole Six Sigma thing? Yeah, so they called and they were improving their youth development programs. I helped them uh, understand a little bit of the Six Sigma process. Um, I kept asking if they wanted me to come and visit with them and do a site visit, but they, <laughs> <laughs> they didn't take me up on it. But, you know, who would have ever thought I would be influencing across the globe? And so uh, that's what's so cool about uh, the time we live in and the impact that we can make, not just even in the U.S., but worldwide. I think, yeah, um, I wanted to ask that as maybe one more question here. The... <laughs> how do you do training internally? Have you done any training? Is it more coaching through some of these concepts? Um, how do you spread that through the why and the locations you've been? Um, what, what do you think works well for getting people familiar with even Demaic or some of these concepts? Well, I, I have, so first of all, I mean, it, for any of our staff members that are interested in doing green belt or yellow belt, uh, we worked out an agreement with our local universities and we pay for that. Great. Uh, so if they want to do that, we'll pay for that. Um, they give us like half off or something like that. Nice. Um, secondly, I do have a collection of videos that some we've done internally. Uh, some of them I've just identified on the internet that just simply explain the process. Yep. Um, and uh, just helping people think through. And if I could just add this, it's a cultural thing. If you want to do continuous improvement, but you do not practice continuous improvement, then after a while, people just stop using continuous improvement. So uh, one of the things I did when I became the CEO here, as I said, I am not taking any questions that's not formatted this way. And I use, they didn't know anything about Six Sigma, mm -hmm. but I use the four headers of Six Sigma. You know, I need you to define the problem. I need you to give me measurements that you think apply here. I need you to tell me how you've analyzed the measurements against that define uh, and what your recommendation is. That's improve. That's thing and I need you to put it on one piece of paper yep. I am not taking a, uh, a meeting uh, for, if you don't have these questions answered now as I've trained them their define gets a little sharper so now they've added um, uh, the cause and effects uh, the, um, uh, the 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 SIPOC and also have a, a charter that we've created, a charter structure. Uh, they, I, they know to come with measurements and that, that we may end the meeting at that moment because I may say you are still lacking this measurement, that measurement, that measurement. Go and check that out. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's become the way they know I'm going to ask questions. So continuous improvement is uh, a culture and culture has to get practice or it doesn't take. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I just think there's a, a, a opportunities for people to just kind of really uh, drive that uh, where they are. Awesome. This, is, this has been wonderful. I've already taken up a lot of your time, but uh, it's been really great. So anything else you wanted to add or comment? 
No, I'd be happy to. I believe they're on the internet, the, the uh, Six Sigma videos okay. that we created so that you can kind of get a sense of how we've uh, structured them, uh, share them uh, with your listeners. Okay. Uh, because I, I, I really do want to emphasize, don't overthink this. You know, it's like riding a bike. You can either ride a bike like uh, the X Games <laughs> and get overwhelmed with that or you can just kind of ride the bike around the block yeah. um, and start riding the bike the six sigma bike the continuous improving bike around the block and let uh x games take care for of themselves okay <laughs> and i think what you'll discover is a whole new way of working and for those individuals that are in my field in the nonprofit field it'll make you uh, a stronger leader, uh, and it will help define you as one of the best in class. Uh, this is something that so few practice, uh, you get known as a person that knows how to solve things. And so uh, there are programs in cities I've never been in, in countries I've never been in, that are being delivered because of the way we influenced and that's what I was hoping to do with my life is to right. influence the lives of kids, even those I've never met. Uh, and that's what uh, continuous improvement does, allows you to scale at that level. So thank you, Brian, for everything you're doing. You bet. No, I really appreciate your time and all your work. This is um, really inspiring. So thank you, thank Jorge, you. for your time. All right. I'll get Bye -bye. those links from you and share those with the listeners. I'll send them along. Okay. Thanks. Thank you Bye. so much. Bye.